Fourteenth Amendment, uh, U.S. citizenship over the constitutional state citizenship, and finally, uh, perhaps your position on the on the birth certificate fraud that uh, so many believe uh, that is the root of all evil and problems that are going on. Maybe uh, you could just delve into some of that for us. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and get into what I've done here in North Carolina here recently. And then we'll get into okay. the administrative stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, a young man came to me here out of nowhere uh, through a connection through, I talked to somebody at Lowe's. He was facing criminal contempt charges here in the local courts. Well, he went in, he challenged the jurisdiction of the court. And the judge said, if you challenge the jurisdiction, I'm going to find you in contempt. Well, the kid did challenge it. He went to jail. And he was supposed to went to jail for 10 days. While he right. was sitting there, he called his bail bondsman, and the bail bondsman told him to file a notice of appeal, stay of judgment. He wrote it up. He got out in three days. Well, that time period, he came to see me. Him and I got talking, so I wrote some paperwork up for him. He had an appeal for the appeals court on this very issue. We got back into North Carolina criminal rules of procedure. We got into their rule books. This is what this, this administrative stuff is all about, it's about getting back into yes. the rules. Well, we got into their right. rules under Article 2 of the criminal rules of procedure. It says under 15A to 102 through 15A through 130, it says reserved for future codification. Really? Yeah. And it, so what it means is that you get into those criminal rules, and they say reserved for future codification, right under jurisdiction, the court don't have it. <laughs> so for future we, clarification that we might say whenever it is we say, whatever how we say, because we're the de facto <laughs> Exactly right. Oh. So, what, so what we've done is we put this in, and we went back in, put the case laws in, shows that you know, we can walk in at any time, and we can challenge the jurisdiction of the court. So this young man had to go into court on February 1st, walked in. I told him that what well, when you do this, take fill out five documents. When you, well, because when we did this, I said, you file five of them. You get one to the prosecutor, one to the judge, one to the clerk of court, and you hold on to two of them, because you're going to need one in court. So right. when he walked into court, and they called him up. They saved him for barely last on this. Of course. And the judge started talking to him. He says, Your Honor, uh, did you get my paperwork? And, of course, the judge fumbled around and said, well, I tell you what, I have a spare copy for you to read. At that point, <laughs> the prosecutor said, uh, Your Honor, let me interrupt here a minute. Uh, if, if Mr. Bodan doesn't mind, let me solve this problem here before we get into it. So the prosecutor went back in and said, Your Honor, if Mr. Bodan was stopped for a traffic violation, he challenged the jurisdiction of the court. The lower court judges were required by Supreme Court decisions and other rulings that when they are challenged, they have to tell you the jurisdiction. So we, right. we moved this court to dismiss this gentleman's case. But they did not get into the first part of the paperwork that says they didn't have criminal jurisdiction. They only got into where the Supreme Court says you could challenge the jurisdiction. Right. They wouldn't dare get into the first part of this and put it on the record. So because he we put in they had no jurisdiction criminally because the rules say they don't, but because we put in that, that you can challenge that jurisdiction, that was the weak link that they went for because they didn't want to talk about the other one. <laughs> the young man got off. They went back and ruled that the judge had no jurisdiction to throw him in jail. So How now, about that? So now this young man has lost his job. He lost a machinist job that was paying $18, $19 an hour plus bonuses at the end of the year. Well, oh, my. 
so they've also they've also not only by kidnapping him, but they've also created damages right. that they're now responsible for. Correct. So this is where this administrative side comes in that I have been doing here in North Carolina. What we're doing is we're now going back in and notifying the different agencies, such as the Judicial uh, Commission standard here in North Carolina, what is also known as the Industrial Commission, and that Industrial Commission, from what I was told and understand, is the one that holds the bond and is risk management for these people. Well, that sure would be how a corporation works, isn't it, sir? <laughs> well, yeah, it would. So what we've done is that we've set this thing up, and we're going to go after these two judges that screwed with him, that cost him his job. But see, from what we've learned here administratively in North Carolina, once we go after them and their public side of that office, because I went after the State Highway Patrol, the Sheriff Department, I went after the Police Department, I went after the Tax Department, I went after the, the court in in Mecklenburg, plus the, the prosecutor's office and the attorney general's office. And also, when I went after State Highway Patrol, I went after the governor's office. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can ever accuse you of not having a, a, a guts and moxie, sir. I have to you, give you that. So what we did, uh, through all these different things that we've done, we went in and we filed and showed where under the general statutes of North Carolina, these are public offices. Well, the prosecutor, which is the United States, which was the North Carolina Attorney General's office, came back in and they told the administrative court, because you got to understand, people, there is a true, true, true administrative court. And that administrative court is that that deals strictly with public offices only, not these courts that we're coming into. See, I was able to find that, uh, that administrative court that strictly deals with public offices, and that's what we've got to look for. Well, can I ask you a question there? And this is, this is one of the things that I've, uh, I've kind of looked at. Our citizenship status uh, prior to 1868 was constitutional state citizens that had the sovereign protection in, uh, of the state and of the state constitutions, yada, yada, yada. When they created that citizenship uh, re via the 14th Amendment citizenship or U.S. citizenship, they basically made us all, uh, and eventually through uh, you know, the international bankers, through the, the a number of processes, basically made us chattel property of the jurisdiction of D.C., contracting with them as if we were uh, employees, uh, in a sense, and then therefore subject to the jurisdiction of that citizenship is where they, they have us. Is that not true? Well, to one extent, yes. To another extent, no. you got to go back and understand. Uh, when they created that 14th Amendment, before they did that, they, the, the states, the state government, they were sovereign. Any time yes. the federal government came into the states, the states basically told them to take a hike. When the Civil War broke out in 1867, the federal government came into all of the state governments. Now, they didn't come into all the people. They only came into the public offices at that time. Right. Under that Reconstruction Act, and they told them, you will relinquish your state sovereignty and you will take on the federal mantle of this. Yes, yeah, so they're all basically essentially federal agents, even, you know, right down to the, I hate to say it, but right down to the municipal court is really, uh, since Reconstruction has been under a form of uh, administrative or, or uh, admiralty jurisdiction, correct? Well, it, it, it's it's administrative. Well, at that time, it was it was uh, military because it was the military that took over at that time. But see, when they did that Reconstruction Act, days afterwards, they did the Fourteenth Amendment. Right, right, right. 
Now, okay, now, if you go back and read that 14th Amendment, see, this is where a lot of people make their mistakes. They only read Section 1 because they don't need to bother reading anything below Section 1. Oh, Section 4 is incredibly important to me. Yeah, Section 2, 3, and 4 is the is the key elements to this because when you get into 2 and 3, it talks about that public office. It doesn't say one thing about freeing the slaves. It doesn't say about giving equal protection to the slaves. It talks about public offices. That section yes. four is if they are insurrection or if they are rebelling against the Constitution, or they're trying to overthrow, that section four does the, the bounty hunter side of section, under Article 14, section four, for the bounty hunters to come in to go after them. But see, that's where the administrative side comes in. Okay. All right. Because um, in order in order to strip them, you have to go through the administrative process like I did here in North Carolina. And when you go into the administrative courts, you want that attorney general says they are not agencies, they're not public officials of this state. And this is right. the rulings that I've got. So Okay. So so what you're saying is, is basically that jurisdiction that was created, and, and here's my, my problem with the 14th Amendment in and of itself, is that I never, I, I don't believe that it was ever lawfully ratified. Was it? Uh, but that's a, that's, a, that's, that's a, a side issue compared to what you're doing. You're taking the battle right into the administrative court. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. We're taking it right into okay. the administrative side. See, what we're using is that 14th Amendment because we're not trying to sue the state. See, that's where people are trying to make mistakes on these Title 42s. They don't strip them, and they're coming back in trying to sue the state. We're not trying to sue the state. Because, see, that okay. 14th Amendment, Section 4, once you strip them of their immunities, they now are on their private side where they have now embezzled any finances off the state, and it's up to us to go back in and collect it to pay the treasury back for such embezzlement. And so that's where the, the that's part of the that was part of the fraud, uh, yes. I believe. Uh, that's part of the fraud. Okay. So okay, so what what is the the proper way forward now? What is the, what is your next uh, your next move here? Okay, with this with the. Uh, the gentleman that I'm working here is that we're, our next move is to go back in and we are to notify the you know, Industrial Commission. We're here, we're here to notify the Judicial Standard Commission. We need to notify the governor. We need to notify, you know, the Attorney General and the Supreme Court that these judges violated their position because they threw this kid in jail and the higher court ruled they didn't have jurisdiction, so the higher court hung them. So now we're call, we're going to go after the state and get the state to come back in and say they don't work here. Because if they do say they work here, now they're going to have to reprimand them, and we still can go back in and get damages. But the state's going to have to pay the damages. If they sit down and say they don't work <laughs> here, now we go after the judges and go after everything they have for damages. Either way, it's a win-win situation on our side. It certainly looks that way. Is uh, uh, everything is the way it's going right now? Certainly, uh, if if we don't do an assail from every angle, I think that it's just going to perpetuate a problem. I I see this as being uh, that citizenship that we were talking about as being, in a way, a, a communist citizenship, because it brought all of our jurisdiction, or at least they try to, through every contract that you make with the federal government. Like the Bundy situation you have going out there, like Bundy say, you have to uh, withdraw your consent to contract, right? Well, they're, they're, they're correct in that you have, to con you, know, you have to do that. But how do you withdraw your consent uh, of a, a class of citizenship that was created not for you, not for a, a northern state. In, in fact, it was only created for 11 rebel states, um, and then it was supplanted in, all, all across every state in the nation. Like Oregon, we have a document from the House floor. Now, Oregon is listed as, as uh, um, ratifying the 14th Amendment, correct? But okay, now you got to remember, every, yeah. supposedly every state, not just the southern states, even the northern states, 
had to take on that 14th Amendment because without that 14th Amendment, they don't have a lawful government under the federal side. Because that's by the force by which, but but what about the force by which they they exerted that? Uh, whenever you put a gun to to somebody's head and say, okay, here's a contract, sign it, and you you will give your consent to it. That's coercion. Is coercion uh, lawful? Uh, uh, when does coercion is, no. become lawful? Well, no, because but the point being of it is, at this point, they're not coming out and saying that it was unconstitutional because the moment they did then the federal government has lost everything and see this right thing. it ceases to ex right it ceases to exist and they would have to either they would have a choice they would either have to act in their constitutional capacity as that was originally uh granted unto them uh which was a position of public trust to protect all of our rights uh, um, uh equally and the, the constitution being the restraint upon them Basically, or the way I see the 14th Amendment is, is that it, it, it basically unleashed the restraint that, that the, the original Constitution existed for. And it basically, with all the powers not inconsistent with the original, created essentially, in theory, a new Constitution because it, took, it destroyed uh, state citizenship which was constitutionally protected, was it not? Well, see, you're, you're mixing a public office with that of you, the state citizen, because as you get into Title VIII, United States Code, Section 1481, okay. anybody who takes an oath of office is required to relinquish their national citizenship. Now, you and I out here, if we was in the military, but the moment we got out, we got put back to our standard citizens. Those who took uh -huh. office. Okay, but what, what we're getting into was in Title Eight, fourteen eighty one. 1481, those who took public office had to relinquish their national citizenship. Okay, now you got to go back and remember, we're going back through history here. In 1871, the District of Columbia was created as a corporation right before, yeah. right after, right after the 14th Amendment. So at the moment the government came in and took over the states, then they turn around and turn it into a corporation, and then in 1945, they placed all these people under UN jurisdiction in 1945. Yes. yes. Okay, so we're not, so we, us, you and I are not under that UN. Only those who hold public office who took that oath are underneath this. Now, through some research, everybody's trying to find out how to separate yourself. I, all the documentation that we have to fill out has that one section, are you a U.S. citizen? And that's the only thing they have on there. And, of course, we don't know any better. Of course, of course, we're born in America. We assume we are U.S. citizens, but we're not that U.S. citizen. What I've discovered through this case out of Texas is I went back in and I started checking the territorial growth of the states and how the states became states and what it did to my surprise i got into this and it showed where whenever the state of ohio you know, nevada california texas all these things came into into being it showed that the states were absolutely separated from the phrase united states and that yes. goes back in to what I've been saying in the D.C. area. If you get into the survey plots and into the 40 stones, on them 40 stones, it is engraved in them stones on the inside, says jurisdiction of the United States, that 10-mile square. On the back yes. side, it's engraved the name of Virginia and Maryland. So, for <laughs> what? Go ahead. Right. So from what we are pulling up and what we're looking at here, everybody's trying to find that separation. But if they would go back and show under their creating of their state that that state is separate from the United States, because it definitely shows a separation. And I even got into Title 31, which is money and finances. I've got into Title 12, the Federal Reserve. And it went back and showed that the United States – was separate from the states. And see, nobody's going after that angle on this. And 
this is what we well, got. It, was, it was created to be. We created it to be a union uh, to uh, uh, essentially provide for the the common defense, uh, and they they took that and they have blown that so far out of out of proportion now with this administrative law that it's everywhere. Or it's really the jurisdiction by which they they. In, in my opinion, uh, tell me if, if you think I'm wrong, they trick people into. Well, yes, it is, because, see, whenever they did that 1933 bankruptcy, whenever they came in and they stole our wages, they stole our ability to make anything, including our property, including our homes and our children. And one of the things that I ran into when I was dealing with D.C., they came out and they asked me, says, Mr. Class, do you own your home? Now, my home is bought and paid for. But they asked me, do you own it? I said, no, sir, I do not own it. Well, do you rent? I said, no, sir, the county owns my home because it is registered to them, and I'm only registered as a tenant, so they own it. Because what we got into was the fact that I was asked if I own my home. I said, no, the county owns it because I'm listed as a tenant. So they said, okay, he doesn't own it. And they asked me if I own my automobiles. I said, no, sir, because the state owns the MSOs, and I'm just listed as a driver. So he doesn't own any automobiles. He says, do you have any light bills? I said, well, yeah. I said, do you make payments? I said, no, sir. All I can do is give them Federal Reserve notes, and that's not money. So, okay. so they put me down for informal papyrus. And that's how I was able to get through all this. And this is what we're coming back in and teaching people. You don't ever sit down and say, well, yeah, I, I pay my bills and I, I own this. You don't own squat, and you can't pay squat. And this, is what that, this is what the bankruptcy did, because I referred it back to the 1933 bankruptcy. And this is where the argument's coming in. Oh, and this is where the birth certificate has come in, and this is why I went back in and showed them under the Social Security Act 1935, under Title V, Section 501, 502, it says that the state receives $1 million for each live birth. I said, so therefore, the state, the state is required to discharge my debt and pay all this stuff. So they just said, okay, and that's how they wrote this thing off. <laughs> That's and and that is exactly right. For those who uh, seem to know that uh, that underlying truth, they trick you into contracting with them by your own, uh, I guess, legal incompetence. Uh, not your own legal. You know what I'm saying. With most people that go into court, uh, they say all of the absolute incorrect things uh, based upon the propaganda that they've been taught over the years. You own your house. You own your car. I, I agree with you uh, wholeheartedly on that. Um, so now this is this is a usable defense uh, apparently. Uh, well, I know that there are some courts that resist it, uh, like uh, like fire. Um, those are the courts that uh, I guess that we're having a, more of a trouble with. But you, you always attack the jurisdiction. Is that correct? Well, you always attack the jurisdiction, but see, you're you're, you're also doing is you're attacking their rules, their regulations, because when I tell people, learn their language, learn their rules, learn their job, and learn what Congress sit here and said. Because when we're coming in, this is one of the things that I fought them with in D.C., this is what we're fighting them with in the administrative courts. Your rules sit down and say, this is how you have to comply, not me, you. Your prosecutor isn't doing it. This is what your jobs are. Because what we went back and did is in 1925, on volume 43 and volume 44, we showed where the United States codes were never passed into law because the Senate found too many errors, so the United States codes were never passed. And really? so what, we're, what we referred back to, when I went into court, it's here at Statutes at Large, volume 43, it stops on March 4th. 1925. Here's volume 44. It starts up on December 16th, 1925. Here's the paperwork that supposed this stuff was passed on December 7th. As you can see in the statutes at large, it's never been listed. But what it does do on June 30th, 1926, it says that Congress allowed it to be published. I said, you do understand there's a difference between publishing it and passing it, right? Yes. And 
the judge looks at the prosecutor and says, can you rebut this man? And all he could do is drop his head and shake his head no. You could not rebut me. Then the next thing I brought in was the 1935 Federal Register, which goes in and shows under the second page, Section 5, is that the president was given permission to codify the statute for administrative and agency's uses. Well, you're not part of the administration, and you're not an agency. And in the, <laughs> and in the National Industrial Recovery Act 1935, it did the same damn thing. And when we brought this in, we went back and showed that all laws apply to their side, which is their administrative procedures. There's nothing that applies to our side other than what well, we are under common law that we don't harm and we don't hurt one another. But when I walked in and proved this, they didn't have no avenues to, to run with. My goodness, they certainly didn't, did they? No, they <laughs> don't. You know, and this is what, and, and then I would turn around and we threw in and said, oh, by the way, you are aware of May 12, 1947? That Title 18, according to congressional records, was never passed by the Senate. So your Title 18, along with all the rest of your codes, really don't mean squat. Not to us. It only applies to you and your kind. Amazing. Once you can put yourself in a proper jurisdiction, then everything kind of starts clearing up. Well, it um, does. What, what, is your, what is your opinion upon the birth certificate and its usage to... Uh, uh, in a sense, enslave us. What is your position on that? Okay, the birth certificate was definitely created by the states according to the Social Security Act of 1935. Uh, the Alien Registration Act was part of that birth certificate. And the reason why they call it alien registration is because once they separated their self from us, we actually became aliens to them. So it's our birth certificate. And see, this is where they, they're hanging this stuff out and try to milk us. But a few of us have called the Federal Reserve Bank on the back of that Social Security card with that tracking number. Yep. We've actually found that there is an actually account sitting there with our name on it because that number on the back is the routing number. Your Social Security number is that, that number for that bank account. That's that bank account number. We actually did some check and found it. But they don't okay. want us to get into it. So basically, the birth certificate, like uh, many have been uh, positing uh, and bringing forward, is is basically part of the Federal Reserve fraud. Well, right. But what that what that is, it is they're supposed to be because it's going to the state. And if you, I ran through several different Social Security acts through the different years, so this is why the statutes at large are so important, people. Because the United States Code is not law. I proved that in 1925. The statutes at large is actual congressional acts. So that's what we have to get into to find this information. And from what it is showing, the Social Security on a regular basis is giving the state Social Security off of your account. So what we need to be doing is we need to be coming back in and challenging the state on this issue, along with the comptroller of currency and the administration on this for Social Security and the Treasury Department, because we need to find out where this money is going and why it is not discharging our debts. But you're not going to walk into the court down the street and say, hey, I want to bring this issue. They're going to tell you we don't have jurisdiction, and they're absolutely right. That's you right. You have to do this administratively. That's yeah. right. They don't have jurisdiction. That's that's a very good point. So when people are trying to come back in and make the issues on acceptance for value in A for Z in these courts, these courts tell you, you know, this is frivolous, it's unintelligible. They're absolutely right. Because when you need to find that A for Z, you don't go to this local court. You go back to the Treasury Department. You go back to the Comptroller of Currency. You go to the Board of Governors. And he said, hey, pursuant to statutes at large for that Title 31, it clearly shows that the United States Treasury Department is collecting credit from the Federal Reserve 
because it says it's collecting the credit upon the people, upon the United States. And that credit is being given to the comptroller currency. The comptroller currency is giving it down to the banking system under Title 30, which is money and finances. You get into Title 12, which is the Federal Reserve, and you start looking all the stuff up under the statutes at large. You start looking up everything for, for banking, look everything up for Federal Reserve, and you'll start seeing that the Federal Reserve only lends credit. And it gets into the banking and sits here and says, because I get into 33, 34, 1967, and 1980. I just went through randomly. And what it shows that once you go down to the bank, you sign that promissory note. That promissory note or that note becomes the collateral, not your home, not your car. Not anything else. That note is the collateral, and that's exactly what it says in the statutes at large. And you're not going to find this in the USC code, so leave this shit out. <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> so this is why, you know, this is why I push people, the statutes at large. And I had a lot of people, well, that don't apply to us, but you're damn right. But it applies to them how they are to operate. Right. You know, this so is where them, people are falling you're hitting short. Them with their own rules. Yeah. See, this is where people are falling short. They come, well, it don't apply. It don't apply to us. Well, you're damn right it don't apply. But who does it apply to? Well, it applies to them. Then why would you not use your own rules against them? Makes sense to me. I mean, I, I do understand that. I really do. I mean, I've been arguing for a long time that the the jurisdiction that they act under is, is, is not proper because of, you know, A, B, C, and D, all of these steps that usurped our sovereignty from – uh, the purported reasons for uh, the civil conflict, the civil war, the war between the states. I, I believe that the international bankers have been behind the scenes uh, manipulating this uh, since then, probably That's before true. then, of course. Um, you know, we found with David Dodge's research, uh, our, many good men have tried to stand up in opposition to this, this planned uh, usurpation uh, and debt enslavement that has been, uh, I mean, it, it, it enveloped the, the United Kingdom, it enveloped France. I think Iceland is on to it, though. <laughs> yeah. But, well, well, see, this is where the problem lies. Whenever you're being drugged into these courts, you automatically try to put up these defense. But you got to remember, it is an agency that's dragging you into this court. They're dragging you into their sandbox, and what you have to do is put your brakes on and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Uh, I'm dealing with child services. Why do I want to go into their court when I need to bring this as an administrative action against them and take them into an administrative court, not this kangaroo court that they're trying to drag me into? See, it's the same thing with I get a, get a speeding ticket, get a t parking ticket, get something for your car. You allow them to drag you into that court when you should hit the brakes and say, whoa, wait a minute, let's go file an administrative into your boss, into the mayor, into city council, into the administrative court, because this is an administrative issue. See, everybody wants to get drugged into that other court. You want to make these arguments, but you're making them in the wrong court. And that's the same thing with IRS. We're going to drag you into the United States Supreme Court. Or into the United States District Court. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You, are you not an agency? Yes. Then let's address this in the administrative court under Title 26, under your appendix, under your Rule 10. Let's go before your administration, and let's bring this before the administrative court, not some U.S. District Court down here who doesn't have the jurisdiction. See, that's where we're making our mistakes. We're not putting the brakes on this and changing venue and changing jurisdiction on them. I see. I see. Now, now stop the thing, so though. What, this what, would you, what would you advise the, the, the all these folks that have been arrested there in uh, Oregon? How would you advise that they – well, not, not advise. That's a bad word uh, to use. Um, if it were you, uh, if you were one of those individuals there, how would you proceed? I would go back in, and I would bring a claim against the administration – that brought their action against me, and I would run them back to their administration and back into their administrative court to get that ruling redefined 
Because what you want is for that administrative court and that attorney general to either come back and say, no, they don't work here. And the moment they do, now you have a lawsuit against them for false imprisonment and false arrest. Well, that certainly seems to be, uh, uh, to me, a more sensible uh, way forward than I see them going with. Now, from what I heard, uh, their attorney believes that they broke the law. Now, if that's the case, and uh, I think that part of the problem is is with some of these bar association attorneys, like like my brother, who went to law schools and were taught, in my opinion, they they did the same thing to them in law school that they do with the younger children in in a lot of these schools that Charlotte Isserby made very clear that they do, the deliberate dumbing down. Well, if you teach people uh, a certain way, then they're going to practice a certain way. Uh, and they're given all sorts of false information and ideas in these law schools. Um, now, I believe that their attorneys are probably acting in, in good faith in their own heads, in their own minds, in their own hearts. But um, to me, it seems as though they're they're directing them down the wrong path. Um, first of all, they're using that um, the jurisdiction of, like you said, uh, that we're supposed to be holding them to uh, to us. So that's yes. part of the fraud in and of itself. Well, see, you got you got to remember something here, and this is one of the issues that I'm making at D.C. and what we're going to be going into courts. Let's lay out the congressional foundation of how the courts were created through the Judiciary Act of 1789. Uh, the courthouse was built. the The DOJ Department of Justice office was built. The United States Attorney's office was built. The U.S. Marshal's office was built. The office was built, but they was never filled. You follow me? Yes, I follow you. Okay, now, the, the 1866 Private Attorney General Act, Congress came out and says, you, me, we have the authority to bring a claim against any corporation or against any of these people that do us wrong. They didn't create the building. They actually gave you and I the authority to walk in and go against those positions that has to go through Congress in order to get their positions. Gotcha. Now, the next issue is, is this. In 1934 and in 1940, the United States Congress, through statutes, gave the Supreme Court the authority to create its own set of rules. Now, this is where it comes in at. They gave them the authority to create the civil rules, the criminal rules. They didn't give them authority to create the, the jurisdiction, for, but they allowed them to create the rules. They allowed them to create the rules for the appellate and all these different courts. No place, no place did they allow the Supreme Court the authority to create a private monopoly association to run the courtroom. 